that's for everyone is the wrong way to go. And then lastly, a reminder of the uh, session, the speaking se plenary session, excuse me, the plenary session later today presented by Johnson & Johnson, which is a Ruha Benjamin uh, titled Race to the Future, Reimagining the Default Settings of Technology and Society, which will be at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. We encourage you to continue sharing snippets or thoughts and feelings about any of the sessions or workshops that you are attending. I'll also be keeping a lookout for pet photos at hashtag AAASPets, but make sure to use hashtag AAASMTG whenever sharing content about the meeting uh, so we can stay connected and communicate throughout this virtual annual meeting. Make sure to also engage with us at AAAS and at AAAS meetings. Uh, Sudip, back to you. Thanks, Jessica. You know, now in our second day here, it's starting to feel a little bit normal to be back in this building again. Uh, but I think we're still a ways off from this being completely normal. Uh, I'm still carrying around my mask, as is everyone else here, and every time I leave this stage, I have to put it back on. Um, and what that's meant is that we've been you know, working from home. Uh, for me, it's meant working from my kids' uh, uh, my kids' playroom at first, and, and then the basement. Uh, I don't know, what's it been like for, for, for you all? Is it, uh, I know you talked a little bit about working maybe uh, outside? Yeah, you know, I think the biggest change for me is probably the amount of toilet paper I have to purchase. And I really felt that AAAS should have sent us all home with a bit of the, you know, your supply of TP just to, you know, fortify our home stock. But you know, Maybe that the world, would have been a good. Uh, you know, good hey, challenge. I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> I think the biggest challenges of working from home are more about home than work. The work just continued. Um, like you, I took over a space in my house. Um, my 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 daughter has one floor, my wife another, and I have the living room. Um, and as I mentioned before, I had a moment of working like during the summer, the really nice months. I was able to kind of sit out on my porch and work from there. Um, but you know, our team um, in the SAT Policy Fellows have fellowships has just sort of picked up the banner, and we stay connected and you know keeping the system moving on. Yeah, you know, we've all gotten used to all this, all this technology. <laughs> Jessica, how about you? Uh, how's how's uh, the pandemic life working from, working from home affected you? Yeah, so I've come to realize that I can write a Facebook post from my office, uh, from the desk in my apartment, even if I want to, you know, lay down on the couch for a little bit. I found that I can still uh, effectively write Facebook posts. I, I, I believe, but uh, where I live in a studio department. I about said department. Oh, I meant a apartment. <laughs> uh, where I live in a studio apartment, uh, my desk is kind of intermingled with my couch and my bed. So sometimes it feels a little difficult to separate kind of the work life from me going to my couch and watching Survivor at the end of the day. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's been a little bit of a challenge. But a plus side is if I wake up a little early in the mornings, I can actually do a little bit of laundry before I go to work. So instead of riding the train to work, I will do the laundry uh, before work. So that's kind of my new uh, commute uh, commute uh, thing that I do uh, every other week or so. So that's been kind of nice to have that, uh, to, to use that time in another way to where I'm not uh, fighting people for the washing right. machine in the, in the laundry room of my apartment building. <laughs> great, great transitions and it keeps you ahead of the game. Right, right. Yes. I feel like I'm prepared. Yeah. <laughs> It feels like we're almost more productive, right? Um, you don't a have little bit, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I have to agree. Um, my biggest, also, the, one of the things that's difficult is just, I, I do have a little one at home, um, and I, I call her my COVID 11 year old because <laughs> at, at 11, she really thinks she's 15. Like the summer grew them exponentially. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my, uh, my 10 year olds are all about the video games, right? Because they can talk to each other in Xbox. Uh, and so they're all meeting up in these virtual worlds. Right, uh, right. They don't need Zoom. They just uh, they just play uh, Minecraft. So. Jessica, how's the fur babies doing? <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Yeah. I, right. I, I don't have children, but I did adopt uh, two kittens, uh, Bojack and Adora. I mentioned them in yesterday's, one of yesterday's AAAS Live Did you broadcast. mention them? Really? 
<laughs> um, and uh, yeah, there it's it's been weird leaving them. I I have a video camera set up in my apartment, so I've been periodically uh, checking on them throughout the day. Uh, but I will say uh, it's it's fun being able to take a break from work sometimes, like for five minutes, and go and pet them. But Bojack, he likes to jump in my lap apparently whenever I have a meeting. So I'm always kind of. <laughs> apologizing before meeting, oh, sorry, Bojack just had to, you know, come sit in my lap, but it's actually really nice to, uh, to be able to spend so much time with them. It's comforting for the viewers, too. It is. Oh. It is. <laughs> That's what they say. <laughs> Usually people are like, oh, so cute, <laughs> and I have to agree. Well, the one downside for me has been, um, uh, has been my eating habits, because uh, I eat during every, well, it seems like every break, and if there's a two minute break between <laughs> Zoom meetings, I go and grab some food. Uh, it's also meant that we order a lot out, uh, including, mm. including pizza. Mm. Uh, and I'm told that it's National Pizza Day today. I'm told. Uh, and so I was told to mention that because it might be on something. <laughs> um, uh, so it is, it is National Pizza Day. Uh, my favorite pizza is uh, actually the pizza that's considered the worst kind of pizza, which is pepperoni and pineapple. Mm. Uh, everybody, everybody thinks that that's uh, that's not a, a good pizza to have, but I enjoy it. All right, uh, you know, okay. to each their own. <laughs> to each their own. That's, <laughs> right. that's not classy. All right, and we've we've hit National Pizza Day, so we're gonna we're gonna move on now uh, <laughs> and get to and and get you to what you've actually been all been waiting for, which is Olga helping guide you through what's coming up uh, in the next block of sessions. Thanks, Sudab. So while we're going to have to get our pizza in other ways today, for those enrolled in the scientific sessions, we have the following blue plate specials starting at 3 p.m. Eastern. Coastal ecosystems, the relationship between community and environment, computational modeling of the ovary, applications for predictive toxicology, exploring tipping points in natural and social systems, institutional responses to COVID, the impact on undergraduate STEM instruction, mitigating the impact of global tick-borne diseases, reducing waste in the U.S. seafood supply chain. This session will focus on the global food, energy, water systems shaping the U.S. seafood supply. While the U.S. government advises doubling seafood consumption for nutritional reasons, it is unclear how to do this sustainably. This session will better quantify the amounts of waste, identify drivers of waste, and describe strategies to increase efficiency of seafood production. And the importance of biological collections in the fight against COVID-19. Join us for an LBTQ plus community coffee at 3 p.m. Eastern in the socially distant mingle. For all interested registrants, we have these exchange events starting at 3 p.m. Eastern. From AAAS, putting your best virtual foot forward. From Arizona State University, innovating organic or agriculture. This is discussion based, so it's first come, first serve. Show up early. At 3.15 p.m. Eastern, we're offering a primer on AAAS's sea change program that Sudup mentioned earlier in the broadcast. You won't want to miss that. Back to you, Sudup. Thanks, Olga. Um, enjoy the hour. You can also stay tuned to this channel. Uh, at the top of the hour, you're going to see an event from the AAAS Responsible AI Lecture Series, uh, again supported by Hitachi. It's an October 7th lecture entitled Responsible AI, Using AI for Human Rights. Uh, enjoy, uh, enjoy whatever session or enjoy the video. Thank you. Welcome to the third and final installment in our 2020 Responsible AI series. My name is Jessica Windham. I direct the Scientific Responsibility, Human Rights and Law Program at AAAS. We serve as host for this series, which is sponsored by Hitachi. Today is International Human Rights Day, the day in 1948 when the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So it's only fitting that today's discussion is focused on the relationship between human rights and artificial intelligence. A review of Science Magazine articles reveals the complex relationship between the two. On the one hand, we hear a lot about the risks and realities of negative human rights impacts of AI. At the same time, AI offers opportunities for tackling tough human rights research and documentation challenges. 
I'm joined by two experts in the field who will explore those topics, but also the question of how we could potentially integrate a human rights-based approach into the deployment and development of AI. Our first guest is Dr. Megan Price. She serves as Executive Director of the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. Megan holds a PhD in biostatistics and has applied her statistical experience to multiple human rights investigations around the world. We're also joined by Enrique Piraces, Director of the Technology Program at the Center for Human Rights Science at Carnegie Mellon University, where he explores both the opportunities and risks associated with new technological developments. Welcome to both of you. The format of the discussion will be an interview with and, and conversation among our guests with time for questions from you, our audience. So I invite you to post your questions throughout the discussion using the chat function at the right hand bottom corner of your screen. Please include your name and if you would like, let us know where you're connecting from. So to get us started, I want to begin with you, Megan. There are several ways in which you and HR DAG are using AI as a tool in human rights investigations. Could you briefly describe for our audience two or three examples? Thank you, yes. Um, one of the first examples is a project that my colleagues are working on with our partners at Data Civica and Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico. And that's work building um, AI or machine learning models to predict geographic locations that are likely to contain what are called fosas clandestinas or hidden graves. And this is a problem throughout Mexico where previously undiscovered graves are, are found uh, and these can be the result of any number of sources of, of violence. And the question our partners posed was, could we develop a model that could identify geographic locations and classify them as having a high probability or low probability of containing one of these undiscovered graves. And so we've been working with our partners to develop that classification model. And one of the things that's been most interesting about that work has been that in this particular case, the results of those models haven't been particularly surprising. Folks who, who do the work on the ground have said, well, of course, those are the those are the geographic regions with the highest probabilities because those are the areas where we know violence is occurring. But the modeling results have still proven really useful because they provide a new tool to those advocacy groups who are requesting investigations to look for those graves, which can be quite difficult and quite dangerous to make that request right now. So having that sort of distance of a scientific model said we should go look here, um, has proven really useful. And that's been a really interesting application for us. And then another uh, use of these same kind of models, but in a really different setting, has been in what we call form extraction, or in trying to pull information out of unfriendly data formats. So PDFs, Word documents, images, um, sometimes that's just a coincidence. That's just the way the data was in, was collected, but other times we think of it as being actually adversarial. An organization has been forced to share data um, through a lawsuit or through a FOIA request, and they're meeting the letter but not the spirit of that request by sharing it in some way that's difficult to access. And it turns out that's also a classification model to classify what kind of document it is, where in the document the information is contained, um, and then extract it into a way that can be analyzed. Great, thank you. And I, I appreciate the insight that sometimes what we're able to do with a new tool is to reveal information that perhaps, as you said, was not so surprising uh, and perhaps could have been discovered in other ways, but and yet there was still value um, in, in applying that tool. So thank you. Enrique, in your work, you've seen AI used to bring together multiple sources of data to inform human rights litigation in particular. What does that look like in practice? Hi, thank you. Um, most of the work that we have been involved from the Center for Human Rights Science is around uh, large collections of data. Uh, one of the things that we have seen is a, a larger interest or a growing interest in making sense out of uh, particularly large collections of videos coming from a, a national conflicts. And what we have seen is uh, in, in, in practice, it's a big challenge around what to do with these collections, how to handle that in terms of the kind of uh, infrastructure that organizations may have to deal with that. 
as well as uh, perhaps uh, uh, expectation that may be difficult to satisfy. I think that one of the things that we have seen is that there is uh, perhaps uh, some lack of literacy around what is uh, possible today uh, with machine learning and computer vision. Um, we have also been aware, and uh, like perhaps some people in the audience, about some exercise that have been trying uh, to create some predictive models uh, around uh, sentencing or decision making uh, by courts. Uh, perhaps uh, some examples around uh, forecasting uh, the outcome of decisions at the European uh, Court for Human Rights is a good example. Uh, and we have seen an increasing interest in trying to model or predict how uh, the outcome of uh, some of these uh, trials. Thank you, Enrique. So, so Megan, AI clearly offers some opportunities um, to address human rights questions in ways that previous tools and methods could not. From a human rights perspective, though, how do you assess the risks and the opportunities inherent in the tools? And, and what does that mean for the way that you do your work at HR DAG? That's, that's a great question. So on our team, we try to think of every new opportunity or every new project in the framework of what's the cost of making a mistake and who's going to bear that cost. And we all know that models are imperfect. And in fact, that's a feature, not a bug of these kinds of models. If we were making perfect predictions, we would, we would have overfit our model. We wouldn't actually be, be gaining the insight that we get from these tools. And so as scientists, that idea of imperfection, we're very comfortable with it. But when we think about the context where we're implementing these models, it's crucial that we ask, well, when that model makes a mistake, whether we think of it as a false positive or a false negative, what is the cost of that mistake and who bears it? And so in the example I mentioned earlier in Mexico, the way we've been thinking about that work is when the model makes uh, a mistake, when it makes perhaps a, a false positive, then what we do is we suggest allocating resources somewhere that they probably weren't needed. So we've perhaps um, inefficiently used our resources. Um, and when we get a false negative, then we miss an opportunity to conduct an investigation that maybe we should have. For the moment in our work in Mexico, we consider those mistakes to be still an improvement on the status quo, uh, or rather what we are able to gain out of the model in exchange for those mistakes. And the cost is borne um, largely by us and our partners and in the resources that we allocate. So in that case, we've determined the advantages of the tools are well worth it. But the counter example that we often think of is in some of the models that Enrique alluded to in criminal justice settings. So if you think about uh, so-called predictive policing or some of these models trying to, trying to make recommendations um, about um, whether someone should be released pre-trial or trying to predict the outcome uh, of, of a, a judicial action. When those models make mistakes, they send police into communities that may already be over-policed. They degrade that community trust and that relationship. Um, or in the case of uh, making recommendations about pre-trial uh, restrictions, they may put someone in jail uh, who, who should not be and who should be released. And those costs are significant. And they are borne by already marginalized or disadvantaged populations who often lack the, the, uh, the power, the, the opportunity to push back on those decisions and those recommendations that are being made by those models. And so in those examples, we consider those costs to be uh, not worth it. We consider those costs to be higher than the advantage gained from any of those model applications. But that's also one of the infrastructures that we try and think about is if we were going to use these tools in those settings, are there ways that we can incentivize that setting so that perhaps the, the designer of the model or the vendor of the tool pays that cost and, and therefore it gets fed back into the system in a different way? Thank you. Yes, this is this is the question that I want to come to. This this assessment rubric that you've developed and that you're applying, thinking about how it can be used more broadly beyond organizations such as your own, which is already um, committed to human rights, not just in service, but in in the development and, and, and applications of its own tools and methods. So Enrique, 
if AI is going to be more widely used as a tool for human rights research and, and, and documentation and investigation, and, and if it's going to be used more widely generally, which it most certainly is, what is the supportive infrastructure needed to effectively achieve that? Thank you. Um, it's quite likely inevitable that artificial intelligence or anything that is under that umbrella will uh, be uh, growingly used in the context of human rights practice. That is not necessarily a good thing. In many cases, uh, we have uh, organizations uh, or human rights practitioners will be forced to adopt technology as a way to uh, avoid obsolescence. So even when inevitable, I think that there should be uh, something in the back of our head thinking that it may not be necessary, but just a forced decision. Uh, that said, in thinking of the infrastructure that uh, we may need for that uh, adoption uh, to be uh, not only efficient, but also meaningful, uh, I, I think that the easier bit is already in the technical infrastructure. Uh, Many of the things that we are allowed to do today uh, are possible because companies have been offering uh, or have been lowering the barrier for uh, us to access uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, computer vision, and the like. So um, in that sense, uh, technical infrastructure is, uh, is perhaps what is the most available. What I think uh, there is a lack of is perhaps on issues that are a bit softer. Uh, um, uh, issues around literacy, infrastructure that, in a way, uh, will allow for uh, judges, for lawyers, uh, mm -hmm. for researchers to understand the nuances around uh, um, artificial intelligence. In the same way, I think that we are lacking of a governance infrastructure. You know, what is that uh, some of these uh, technologies uh, are doing will remain obscure uh, for a long time uh, without, without having a, an infrastructure for explainability. In, in that sense. And I think that that's, those softer needs are, are the ones that are the most challenging and in some ways uh, the most uh, necessary. Um, yeah. So I, I, I want to delve into that a little bit more. Um, I'll, I'll ask you, Megan, but then Enrique, I, you may have something else that you'd like to add as well. O on, these, on these softer issues, beyond the technical capacity um, of, of the tools of AI now and as they're being developed, are there existing models um, that you've seen applied in practice or, or perhaps that you're seeing promoted that should be applied for effectively embedding human rights and ethics into the AI development process? I wish I had a better answer to that question. I mean, I think at, I think at a um, long-term view perspective, there's a lot more action within the academic community to try and embed human rights and ethics from the beginning in a lot of these education programs. And I think there are also a lot of existing academic venues, conferences like the Fairness, Accountability and Transparency conferences um, that are really addressing some of these questions. But those we're not going to reap the benefits of the education and the training that those individuals are getting um, for years, uh, which is fine. That's one angle. Um, but there are um, there are implementations of these models affecting people's lives right now every day. And so many of those are being implemented within large private tech companies. And I worry that, in fact, what we're witnessing right now is a lot of ethics washing um, and a lot of of surface value talking about ethics without perhaps doing the harder work of truly embedding and incentivizing application of a human rights and ethics lens. And because so much of this is happening within private industry, I honestly don't have a good answer or, or an idea for what that model might look like. I mean, regulation is one one tool in the toolkit that has obviously had very mixed results in, in a variety of other settings. Um, and, and to go back to the academic example, I think one thing that academics have a tendency to reach for is some sort of a review board. And I think institutional review boards have had fairly mixed results as well too. So unfortunately, I, I don't have sort of strong positive use cases. Um, and I do also just want to vigorously agree with Enrique's point about the need for a lot of this, this, this the other pieces around the technology and the communication and the education piece. Um, that, that has very much been our experience as well in working with a lot of our partners where they say really the need that they have is to to have better tools and better um, better assistance in 
helping people understand the impacts that these are having and the ways that they're getting used out in the real world. Thank you. So, Enrique, I'll, I'll turn this, the question to you as well. And you identified as sort of these these soft needs of, of literacy and governance. Um, are, are there existing models that you think should be expanded upon? Or are there promising areas um, of, of potential um, uh, growth or, or um, development in these areas that you think we should be promoting and really applying more in practice so that we are we are infusing human rights into development and deployment from the ground up. At the governance level, I think that there is a significant gap and there's so far not a not great commitments. I think there are good answers. There are good ideas out there. There's, uh, there's for example, uh, issues where we can learn from the way the pharmaceutical industry is regulated, or the way the the, the food and uh, alim, uh, uh, food industry is regulated in terms of like uh, letting you know what is inside the box, right? Mm -hmm. The amount of sugar that is inside that, the impact that you know certain uh, ingredients may have in certain populations. That is something that could be extrapolated. That could be brought to some of this. Like it would be interesting, and again, uh, as an example, to know, you know, how good, how bad this could be for you if you are a Latino immigrant to the U.S. Right? This piece of technology could have this effect on you. Um, now that said, in, in artificial intelligence, in the developing technology, in, in reality, like one of the big challenges is that it's a it's a it's a rapidly developing space, and perhaps some of the uh, some of the uh, exercises of transparency in some companies are a good beginning. I mean, again, I think that, and I agree with Megan, that these are just mostly uh, some ethic washing exercises, but, you know, there may be some crevices where some of those things can be uh, deepened or expanded. Uh, I do think that there is a, a, an opportunity around uh, that is perhaps the result of the lack of uh, knowledge around the specificity uh, of the underpinnings of some of these technical developments uh, that may allow to uh, for us to uh, promote or or propose uh, forward-looking bits of technology. Uh, my sense is that if we were to focus on explainability per se, as a building block of many other great things, we could convince uh, some of these actors to set the first step. You know, just in, in knowing what something is doing, we could then find other ways for uh, accountability, ethics, and others. Great, thank you. So a question for both of you, pivoting now back to, to the positive applications uh, of AI for human rights. What do you both see as the new frontier in that area? What questions might be able to be answered that couldn't previously? Or, or what hurdles might we be able to overcome in human rights investigations with the use of AI tools? Um, Megan. Um, well, I'll start with uh, just some of the specific applications that my organization focuses on. And what we've really seen in the last year or so has been just a tremendous increase in what we can consider data, what we can, can turn into quantifiable, analyzable data, and how we can fill in gaps uh, in, in existing data. So not only leveraging AI for things like, like form extraction and, and getting information out of unfriendly formats, but also leveraging those same kind of classification models to try to predict uh, missing values. And it's been really interesting for me with a background in, st in statistics, because in some sense, a lot of these a lot of these problems have been around for a very long time, and it's a little bit easy to think of them as solved problems, to think, well, there's been missing data imputation, or there's been particular methods to adjust for this kind of missing data or this kind of non-response error. And, and it's true that, as is so often the case in science, these are problems that we've been working on for quite some time. But I really feel like in the last year, in our specific use cases, the kind of structured data that we have and, and unstructured data we really turned a corner in, in how much of it we're able to turn into analysis ready data sets and get at a lot of questions that we've really been hesitant to use quant, uh, quantitative analysis for, that we've really encouraged more qualitative work. And I think that mixed methods approach is always gonna be valuable, um, but there are a lot of questions around um, things like cause of death and perpetrator groups that 
that have, are really, really hard to document in a lot of settings. And I think we now have better tools to extract and make use of that limited amount of information that we have on some of those topics. Great, thank you. Enrique. Uh, that's great. Um, I, uh, so I think that there's several places where I can get excited about the future of uh, artificial intelligence or whatever is under that umbrella uh, in the context of human rights practice. Uh, first, uh, small things, things that may look as interesting as others, but uh, I do think that there is the possibility for great efficiency in a, uh, for the creation of efficiency in small tasks that right now are getting on the way of uh, organizations uh, trying to manage large volume of data. You know, like the automatic creation of a uh, mosaic images that assist or aid in the location of a particular incident you know, uh, is something that I can imagine uh, becoming a, a good example of the application of AI. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, applying AI to small tasks I, that can create efficiency in places that are already strained by, by resources. Uh, another space where my colleagues are working uh, in, is around uh, event reconstruction. What can we do uh, to gather uh, uh, mixed formats of information and create a, a much better view of something that has happened? Uh, colleagues, at, my colleagues at CMU as well as in situ have played with this in uh, the recreation of events in the Ukraine, for example, and that has allowed for a judge to better understand what may have happened. Um, another thing that I, I am interested or curious, and I think that could be something quite interesting over time, is what is that we do as with these new tools, and what is that we can do with these new tools to better understand our past, you know, our short and long term past? How is that we can review issues? Or, uh, related to human rights abuse, uh, and what is it we can learn once that we use these tools for that? Um, and finally, perhaps, is uh, what can come as the result of uh, the democratization of access to technologies. A lot of the things that we see today as advancements are the result of the opening, of the open sourcing of uh, some simple technologies, or relatively simple technologies, in in contrast to what uh, you know, some heavy corporations or large intelligence apparatus have. But uh, I'm very curious. I think that the next frontier, in a sense, is going to be ones that uh, uh, populations in what some of us may still call the global south, you know, what is going to happen once that the others start to take care of their problems? What is when the solutions start to come from the people that do perceive and have the problems? Uh, you know, with a different level of agency and interest. And I think that that particular space is going to be incredibly interesting. Great, thank you both so much. Well, we're coming towards the end of our time. Uh, I wanna give you each an opportunity to make any kind of closing remarks that, that you would like. You've got a couple of minutes. Um, Megan, first you. Thanks. Um, I think I, I mostly just want to sort of reiterate and, and continue to, to vigorously agree with Enrique. Um, I mean, these these tools we so often hear in this context that that technology is neutral or, or things like that and at its barest sense i suppose that's true but but then it's used by people and it's used in many cases on people and so i think that the more we can ask you know either the question our team asks what's what's the cost of getting it wrong um the, the better. And I think the more we can really think about, uh, as we've been discussing, these the soft pieces around the technology. How are we explaining it to people? Um, how are we educating folks about the way it's getting used? And that may be the folks that decisions are being made for or about. Uh, that may be the folks who are using it as a tool. That may be judges and lawyers. Um, and so I think having this more expansive view not just of the, the model itself and the math and the science involved, but all of these surrounding contextual pieces, uh, I think is really gonna be crucial as we start to use it more and more in these human rights applications. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you. So perhaps one thing that I, I have learned and I would like to share with others is the value of com uh, connecting communities of practice. Uh, perhaps the, the biggest value I have seen uh, in terms of the application of artificial intelligence uh, to human rights uh, research, uh, has come as the result of connecting practitioners, often in academia, but uh, and, and less often in corporations, with practitioners on uh, the human rights space. And that connection that is, it, it, it's away from the, the big discourse around the impact of artificial intelligence, the fear of singularity and the like, has, uh, has become incredibly valuable. That short-term uh, application oriented has been uh, fantastic. 
Um, yeah. Thank you, Enrique. I think we have time for, for maybe a question or two before we close. And we have, a, we have a specific question for you, Megan, based on the work you described in Mexico. Um, and it's, it's asking how much ground truth do you have to do to validate the model you use in Mexico? Uh, and is there a lot of it? Uh, what is the spatial granularity of the model's output? Which is a very specific <laughs> question and, and you may not have that answer right at hand, but, but I think you understand the, the, the intention of the question. Yeah, it's it's a great question because in in all of our applications, ground truth is is so hard to come by. If it exists at all, uh, it's very expensive. And so, in the particular case of this work in Mexico, our partners have relied on two primary data sources: um, media sources that have documented the discovery of these hidden graves, and uh, judicial uh, legal findings from the investigations where these graves have been found. And so those are the two sources of ground truth for where graves have been found. And then of course the hardest part is identifying where graves have not been found because the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Um, and that's where we rely so heavily on our partners who really do have a very deep contextual knowledge of the setting and have been able to say to us with, with some confidence, no, in, in these years and these locations, we really think it's, it's not just that no graves have been found, we think it's true that no graves exist. Um, and so that's really uh, sort of the structure of, of our, our data is areas that are labeled as yes, the graves have been found. No, they don't exist. And we don't know. And that's, of course, what the model is predicting. Uh, and then standard machine learning practice. We hold some data out to then test our model. Uh, we found that it is pretty accurate at, at identifying the, the status of, of known geographic locations. Um, I actually do have the answer to the, the spatial granularity question, which is right now it's at the municipio level, which is, is quite a large geographic region. Um, it's essentially like a state. Um, and that is one of the things that we're working on is if we can't necessarily define a smaller geographic region, can we add more to the model that tells us more about attributes of an area within a municipio? So is it near water or is it near a road? Um, we're starting to describe more geographic attributes. Um, but right now the granularity is uh, rather large. And again, that comes from the data that we have access to is, is at that level as well. Great, thank you very much. Well, I'm afraid we do need to wrap up uh, our discussion today. And I, I really want to thank Dr. Megan Price and Enrique Pirases for joining us for our conversation on Human Rights Day about AI and human rights. And I also want to thank Hitachi for sponsoring the event, uh, which is the final in our series for 2020 on responsible AI, where we started the series looking at uh, environmental monitoring and sustainability as it relates to AI. Then we moved to AI, triage, and the COVID-19 pandemic. And today we've been focused on AI and human rights. Uh, we have archived all of the conversations in this series and last year's on our website. I encourage you to go to those if you hadn't, haven't had a chance to either listen in at the time or to read the uh, resources associated with each event. So thank you all very much. I wish you all a safe and healthy 2020 and I hope to see you next year. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Welcome to the third and final installment in our 2020 Responsible AI series. My name is Jessica Windham. I direct the Scientific Responsibility, Human Rights and Law Program at AAAS. We serve as host for this series, which is sponsored by Hitachi. Today is International Human Rights Day, the day in 1948 when the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So it's only fitting that today's discussion is focused on the relationship between human rights and artificial intelligence. A review of Science Magazine articles reveals the complex relationship between the two. On the one hand, we hear a lot about the risks and realities of negative human rights impacts of AI. At the same time, AI offers opportunities for tackling tough human rights research and documentation challenges. I'm joined by two experts in the field who will explore those topics but also the question of how we could potentially integrate a human rights-based approach into the deployment and development of AI. Our first guest is Dr. Megan Price. She serves as Executive Director of the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. Megan holds a PhD in biostatistics and has applied her statistical experience to multiple human rights investigations around the world. We're also joined by Enrique Pirases, Director of the Technology Program at the Center for Human Rights Science at Carnegie Mellon University, where he explores both the opportunities and risks associated with new technological developments. Welcome to both of you. The format of the discussion will be an interview with and, and conversation among our guests with time for questions from you, our audience. So I invite you to post your questions throughout the discussion using the chat function at the right hand bottom corner of your screen. Please include your name and if you would like, let us know where you're connecting from. So to get us started, I want to begin with you, Megan. There are several ways in which you and HR DAG are using AI as a tool in human rights investigations. Could you briefly describe for our audience two or three examples? Thank you, yes. Um, one of the first examples is a project that my colleagues are working on with our partners at Data Civica and Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico. And that's work building um, AI or machine learning models to predict geographic locations that are likely to contain what are called fosas clandestinas or hidden graves. And this is a problem throughout Mexico where previously undiscovered graves are, are found, uh, and these can be the result of any number of sources of, of violence. And the question our partners posed was, could we develop a model that could identify geographic locations and classify them as having a high probability or low probability of containing one of these undiscovered graves? And so we've been working with our partners to develop that classification model. And one of the things that's been most interesting about that work has been that in this particular case, the results of those models haven't been particularly surprising. Folks who, who do the work on the ground have said, well, of course, those are the those are the geographic regions with the highest probabilities because those are the areas where we know violence is occurring. But the modeling results have still proven really useful because they provide a new tool to those advocacy groups who are requesting investigations to look for those graves, which can be quite difficult and quite dangerous to make that request right now. So having that sort of distance of a scientific model said we should go look here um, has proven really useful. And that's been a really interesting application for us. And then another uh, use of these same kind of models, but in a really different setting, has been in what we call form extraction or in trying to pull information out of unfriendly data formats. So PDFs, Word documents, images, um, sometimes that's just a coincidence. That's just the way the data was, in, was collected. But other times we think of it as being actually adversarial. An organization has been forced to share data um, through a lawsuit or through a FOIA request, and they're meeting the letter, but not the spirit of that request by sharing it in some way that's difficult to access. And it turns out that's also a classification model to classify what kind of document it is, where in the document the information is contained, um, and then extract it into a way that can be analyzed. Great, thank you. And I, I appreciate the insight that sometimes what we're able to do with a new tool is to reveal information that perhaps, as you said, was not so surprising 
uh, and perhaps could have been discovered in other ways, but and yet there was still value um, in, in applying that tool. So thank you. Enrique, in your work, you've seen AI used to bring together multiple sources of data to inform human rights litigation in particular. What does that look like in practice? Hi, thank you. Um, most of the work that we have been involved from the Center for Human Rights Science is around uh, large collections of data. Uh, one of the things that we have seen is a, a larger interest or a growing interest in making sense out of a particularly large collections of videos coming from a, a national conflicts. And what we have seen is, uh, in, in, in practice, is a big challenge around what to do with these collections, how to handle that in terms of the kind of uh, infrastructure that organizations may have to deal with that, as well as uh, perhaps uh, uh, expectations that may be difficult to satisfy. I think that one of the things that we have seen is that there is uh, perhaps uh, some lack of literacy around what is uh, possible today uh, with machine learning and computer vision. Um, we have also been aware, and uh, like perhaps some people in the audience, about some exercise that have been trying uh, to create some predictive models uh, around uh, sentencing or decision-making uh, by courts. Uh, perhaps uh, some examples around uh, forecasting uh, the outcome of decisions of the European uh, Court for Human Rights is a good example. Uh, and we have seen an increasing interest in trying to model or predict how uh, the outcome of uh, some of these uh, trials. Thank you, Enrique. So, so Megan, AI clearly offers some opportunities um, to address human rights questions in ways that previous tools and methods could not. From a human rights perspective, though, how do you assess the risks and the opportunities inherent in the tools? And, and what does that mean for the way that you do your work at HR DAG? That's, that's a great question. So on our team, we try to think of every new opportunity or every new project in the framework of what's the cost of making a mistake and who's going to bear that cost. And we all know that models are imperfect. And in fact, that's a feature, not a bug of these kinds of models. If we were making perfect predictions, we would, we would have overfit our model. We wouldn't actually be, be gaining the insight that we get from these tools. And so as scientists, that idea of imperfection, we're very comfortable with it. But when we think about the context where we're implementing these models, it's crucial that we ask, well, when that model makes a mistake, whether we think of it as a false positive or a false negative, what is the cost of that mistake and who bears it? And so in the example I mentioned earlier in Mexico, the way we've been thinking about that work is when the model makes uh, a mistake, when it makes perhaps a, a false positive, then what we do is we suggest allocating resources somewhere that they probably weren't needed. So we've perhaps um, inefficiently used our resources. Um, and when we get a false negative, then we miss an opportunity to conduct an investigation that maybe we should have. For the moment in our work in Mexico, we consider those mistakes to be still an improvement on the status quo, uh, or rather what we are able to gain out of the model in exchange for those mistakes. And the cost is borne um, largely by us and our partners and in the resources that we allocate. So in that case, we've determined the advantages of the tools are well worth it. But the counter example that we often think of is in some of the models that Enrique alluded to in criminal justice settings. So if you think about uh, so-called predictive policing or some of these models trying to, trying to make recommendations um, about um, whether someone should be released pre-trial or trying to predict the outcome uh, of, of a, a judicial action. When those models make mistakes, they send police into communities that may already be over-policed. They degrade that community trust and that relationship. Um, or in the case of uh, making recommendations about pretrial uh, restrictions, they may put someone in jail uh, who, who should not be and who should be released. And those costs are significant and they are borne by already marginalized or disadvantaged populations who often lack the, the, uh, the power, the, the opportunity to push back on those decisions and those recommendations that are being made by those models. And so in those examples, 
we consider those costs to be uh, not worth it. We consider those costs to be higher than the advantage gained from any of those model applications. But that's also one of the infrastructures that we try and think about is if we were going to use these tools in those settings, are there ways that we can incentivize that setting so that perhaps the, the designer of the model or the vendor of the tool pays that cost and, and therefore it gets fed back into the system in a different way? Thank you. Yes, this is this is the question that I want to come to. This this assessment rubric that you've developed and that you're applying, thinking about how it can be used more broadly beyond organizations such as your own, which is already um, committed to human rights, not just in service, but in in the development and, and, and applications of its own tools and methods. So Enrique, if AI is going to be more widely used as a tool for human rights research and, and, and documentation and investigation. And, and if it's going to be used more widely generally, which it most certainly is, what is the supportive infrastructure needed to effectively achieve that? Thank you. Um, it's quite likely inevitable that artificial intelligence or anything that is under that umbrella will uh, be uh, growingly used in the context of human rights practice. That is not necessarily a good thing. In many cases, uh, we have uh, organizations uh, or human rights practitioners will be forced to adopt technology as a way to uh, avoid obsolescence. So even when inevitable, I think that there should be uh, something in the back of our head, thinking that it may not be necessary, but just a forced decision. Uh, that said, in thinking of the infrastructure that uh, we may need for that uh, adoption, uh, to be uh, not only efficient, but also meaningful. Uh, I, I think that the easier bit is already in the technical infrastructure. Uh, many of the things that we are allowed to do today uh, are possible because companies have been offering uh, or have been lowering the barrier for uh, us to access uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, computer vision, and the like. So um, in that sense, uh, technical infrastructure is uh, is perhaps what is the most available. What I think uh, there is a lack of is perhaps on issues that are a bit softer, uh, um, uh, on issues around literacy, infrastructure that in a way uh, will allow for uh, judges, for lawyers, uh, mm -hmm. for researchers to understand the nuances around uh, um, artificial intelligence. In the same way, I think that we are lacking of a governance infrastructure. You know, what is that? Uh, some of these uh, technologies uh, are doing will remain obscure uh, for a long time uh, without, without having a, an infrastructure for explainability in, in that sense. And I think that that's, those softer needs are, are the ones that are the most challenging and in some ways uh, the most uh, necessary. Um, so I, I want to delve into that a little bit more. Um, I'll, I'll ask you, Megan, but then Enrique, you may have something else that you'd like to add as well. On these on these softer issues, beyond the technical capacity um, of, of the tools of AI now and as they're being developed, are there existing models um, that you've seen applied in practice or, or perhaps that you're seeing promoted that should be applied? for effectively embedding human rights and ethics into the AI development process? I wish I had a better answer to that question. I mean, I think at, I think at a um, long-term view perspective, there's a lot more action within the academic community to try and embed human rights and ethics from the beginning in a lot of these education programs. And I think there are also a lot of existing academic venues, conferences like the Fairness, Accountability and Transparency conferences um, that are really addressing some of these questions. But those, we're not gonna reap the benefits of the education and the training that those individuals are getting um, for years, uh, which is fine, that's one angle, um, but there are um, there are implementations of these models affecting people's lives right now every day. And so many of those are being implemented within large private tech companies. And I worry that in fact, what we're witnessing right now is a lot of ethics washing um, and a lot of, of surface value talking about ethics without perhaps doing the harder work of truly embedding and incentivizing application of a human rights and ethics lens. And because so much of this is happening within private industry, I honestly don't 
have a good answer or, or an idea for what that model might look like. I mean, regulation is one one tool in the toolkit that has obviously had very mixed results in in a variety of other settings. Um, and and to go back to the academic example, I think one thing that academics have a tendency to reach for is some sort of a review board. And I think institutional review boards have had fairly mixed results as well, too. So unfortunately, I, I don't have sort of strong, positive use cases. Um, and I do also just want to vigorously agree with Enrique's point about the need for a lot of this, this, this the other pieces around the technology and the communication and the education piece. Um, that, that has very much been our experience as well in working with a lot of our partners, where they say really the need that they have is to to have better tools and better um, better assistance in helping. Welcome back, everybody. We're coming up on 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Uh, I want to take a moment once again to acknowledge our generous sponsors. Because of their support, we're able to, get, to offer a deeply discounted registration rate for this year's scientific program. And as I said, I hope you noticed. Uh, to our host institution, Arizona State University, to Johnson & Johnson, to the Government of Canada, and to the This Study Shows, a podcast from Wiley, and to BD. Thank you all for your generous support. Uh, we're coming up on the end of the day, and uh, we're going to be seeing our plenary uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, so let's get to our final check uh, before that on what's up on social media with Jessica. Thank you so much, Sudup. Yes, this is the final social media checkup for today, but that doesn't mean you should stop posting. <laughs> Please make sure to use hashtag AAASMTG to share any thoughts, feelings, or any snippets that you see from any sessions or workshops that you are attending. This is a way to help us uh, chat and stay connected throughout this virtual meeting. Now, since this is the last uh, social media check-in for today, uh, this means that we will be looking at hashtag AAAS pets. So I have a ton of pet posts to share. Uh, here is one from Suzanne Martyr Black. Uh, Lincoln was watching the treating and autoimmune disease in mice with an mRNA uh, vaccine. Uh, that is, I believe that was based on science research, but correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, uh, but uh, that is such a cute photo. I was hoping someone would post uh, uh, an image of their pet watching one of the uh, Zoom, uh, Zoom calls. So I'm really glad that did happen. <laughs> okay, and Cynthia here uh, writes, uh, her cats Nosy and Cozy, oh, that's so cute and it rhymes are ready to attend their first hashtag AAAS MTG today. They would like to know who else's pets are joining today. Uh, well, uh, unfortunately, Bojack and Adora cannot be watching virtually since I am at the headquarters, but uh, they are here in spirit as well. And we have other pets as well, including Wesley here, who wants to know uh, why uh, their owner is laughing and disturbing their nap. Uh, and this was during uh, Science Cohen's mother talking to Anthony Fauci when she asked a question about when her and her friends can play Mahjong again together. And the answer to that is the CDC does not have recommendations yet on that, but they will be forthcoming. So just a reminder on that. But that is just a precious kitty. I'm very happy to see that. And then Dr. Kristen Lewis here uh, for today's hashtag AAASMTG, hashtag AAASPets. I bring you the <laughs> reluctant cooperation of Tolly. Aw, the background is about Tolly. So she, she took one of the, uh, the, the AAAS backgrounds that we have that you can download at virtual.aas.org backslash landing. Uh, and, oh, that's so cute, runs on licks. <laughs> That is so, that's such a good idea. I, I would do that if I, uh, if I, if this was a green screen, I would, that would be on my list to do. That is so cool. Thank you for sharing, uh, Kristen. And now I'm going to turn to a few reminder tweets as well as some other posts that we have seen uh, as we round out the day. The Science Careers tweet, I shared this earlier, but as another reminder, uh, tomorrow there will be a live chat with the editors of Science Magazine. So if you have any burning questions about research, uh, make sure to bring them to this chat. Uh, you can click the Ask the Editors icon on the Science Journal's Exchange page 
to join. Uh, so uh, if you're looking for this link in particular, you can search Science Careers on Twitter, and this tweet will be in their feed for you to check out their link. Let's see. And here we have an Instagram from, I believe it is, it is the New Hampshire Academy of Sciences. Uh, one benefit of a virtual conference is that it doesn't interrupt bench work. So uh, Dr. Fauci's plenary session from yesterday is in the background as they're doing science. That is actually, I mean, that is super cool. <laughs> that is super cool. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that on Instagram. And speaking of plenary sessions, uh, in just under an hour, actually uh, just uh, in a few minutes, uh, <laughs> there will be a plenary session presented by Johnson & Johnson. Uh, it is titled race to the future, question mark, reimagining the default settings of technology and society uh, from Ruha Benjamin. Uh, she is, will be speaking here shortly, so make sure to stay tuned for that. Uh, this is a shorter social media update than typically, but uh, make sure to engage with us at AAAS and at AAAS meetings, hashtag AAAS MTG. I know I just threw a lot at you. I hope it's not too much, but just make sure to, uh, to continue to engage with us as we uh, round out day two of the virtual meeting. Suda? Thanks, Jessica. You've done a great job keeping an eye on the social media skies today. Thank you so much, and we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, I'm so pleased to be joined now uh, by my colleague Holden Thorpe, Editor-in-Chief of the Science Family of Journals. Uh, again, coming to us live from his home studio in Orlando, Florida. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, about COVID. Holden, good, uh, good afternoon. Hey, great to see you. Meeting's going great. Everybody's really enjoying it. It's a, it's a, it's a fun one to watch. I, I just had a, I posted a, a, a picture just a few minutes ago of me watching 20 screens at the same time. I uh, only can focus on one at a time, but uh, it is an amazing amount of content. Um, Holden, I was hoping that we'd talk today about, uh, about the, what COVID has done to the review process for science. Uh, just a remarkable, uh, remarkable number of papers. I, I remember I was, uh, I was presenting at some meeting and I said, oh, we've had 1,200 papers. And you said, well, that was an old number. Uh, what's the number today? How many, how many COVID papers have we gotten in the Science Family well, Journal? Well over 5,000. Uh, now that's breaking down. That's all uh, six journals. And that's uh, including uh, commentary pieces that have come into Insights for Science and a few commentary pieces to the other journals, uh, probably around 4,000 um, research papers. And that's really just the ones that ended up getting submitted. There were a lot of people who wrote to us with various things uh, that uh, we, we uh, told, you know, pr this is probably not for us before they ever actually submitted. So it's hard to know really how many papers we've been approached about. It's, it's many thousands. For a virus that was discovered uh, you know, just a little over a year ago, that's pretty amazing. Uh, so, what, what did what, what changed about our processes in that time? Because I know that you know it's been really important to get research results out into the public domain. Uh, what's changed about what we're doing? Well, we agreed with a lot of the other top journals uh, early on that we would have several principles. One of which was we would encourage, but not require, people to put up a preprint. Uh, which is an early version of the paper that can go online and be freely accessible. That way, people who wanted to access the data could do so while we were carrying out our review. We agreed to make all of the COVID papers uh, free, uh, the versions of record that are posted on the website, and we agreed to process them as quickly as we could. And that has varied all the way from nine days for the spike protein uh, that we got um, er, very early on from Barney Graham and Jason McClellan all the way up until recently. We're still pushing COVID papers through in an expedited way. And that's a tribute to the uh, tireless work that our folks are doing, especially Caroline Ash, Val DeVinson, Seth Scanlon, the folks at uh, Science Immunology, STM, uh, science advances um, and science signaling. Uh, we're really happy the science signaling COVID paper uh, has been highlighted at the meeting here. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's really just comes down to the editors and reviewers working extremely hard to get all this done on behalf of the people of the world. What's, uh, you know, just turn into the science. What's, what's, gotten you excited about what you've seen in the journal? I know you talked about the spike protein, uh, some modeling papers. What, what's been exciting to you? 
Well, there was a modeling paper from March of last year that um, I hope people lo will look at. It's the first paper really that outlines the notion of the asymptomatic spread. And there's been a lot of confusion about that. So for the science communications folks watching this, maybe you can tell me why a million people plus have downloaded that paper, but we're still having big arguments about uh, whether there's asymptomatic spread or not. Um, and then I think in going into the immunology, uh, lots of stuff about the autoantibodies, about the interferon response, um, you know, really describing what happens when uh, COVID uh, infection occurs uh, biologically. You know, and you then I think, you know, the, the, the monoclonal antibodies, we had the original Regeneron papers. Uh, we had a lot of the early, especially the non-human primate vaccine stuff. So it's been, been, a, been a big year for us with, with all of this. Um, and a lot of really important papers have been in science. Uh, one of the things that I think people sometimes have a hard time connecting is the basic research to the fact that a vaccine is coming from, uh, uh, from industry. Uh, there's a story about uh, prolines involved uh, in this. Can you tell that story? Just what's the connection between this basic research and, uh, and, and a vaccine being available so quickly? Yeah, well, fortunately, uh, Jason McClellan and Barney Graham understood that they they put some prolines in the spike protein, they could stabilize it uh, in a way that would make it more effective as the vaccine. That was, those were ideas that they had been developing beforehand. But if you hear them tell the story, they went very quickly from the structure of the spike protein to, um, you know, formulating the vaccine. I mean, all within a period of a very short number of weeks. Barney Graham, has recently decided to get on Twitter. Uh, he's already amassed quite a large number of followers, as you might expect. Yeah. And he's been laying out this uh, narrative for a lot of people. And I think they've enjoyed hearing the story, but it's a great um, narrative that goes from characterizing the spike protein all the way to formulating the version of the spike protein with the prolines that goes into the vaccine to formulating the vaccine and putting it in an animal, you know, all within a pe period of a very short number of weeks. Yeah, I've been watching that on Twitter. He's worth a follow, Barney Graham. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's amazing, right? We know that there are scientists um, at some of the small companies who are who are uh, who will certainly be rewarded uh, for uh, for their work on COVID, uh, and then we have these government scientists who are uh, who are working 24 hours a day as well, uh, and they're rewarded with. Um, uh, with our goodwill and with uh, hopefully some research dollars. Yeah, the, um, you know, the, the group at the NIH has really done a tremendous job, but um, they can't manufacture a vaccine and do clinical trials on it by right. themselves. So the coordination between uh, them and the companies has been really impressive. And, you know, as somebody who's a big fan of smaller biotech companies to see uh, BioNTech and Moderna and Novavax now becoming household names right alongside the big pharma companies, I think is another important part of the story. It's really exciting, it's really exciting. Well, uh, in the couple minutes, just the minute that we have left, is there, uh, is there anything that's come out of what's changed in our processes because of COVID uh, that's gonna stick, uh, that's, gonna, uh, that's gonna stick in the journals? Oh, well, I mean, I think uh, for sure, um, just the way of interacting with everybody online uh, is, is going to change things dramatically, you know, for us. We have a lot of uh, editors who aren't in the D.C. area, and we've gotten a lot better at interacting with them, those of us who are in D.C. So that's a big and important thing for our process, but then also... Uh, just the way that we've been able to use those same tools to interact more efficiently with with authors and reviewers and um, you know we did just roll out a this is the kind of thing only only we love in our world but we just did roll out a an update to our manuscript submission system cts that streamlines a number of things and there are um, things that we've learned during the pandemic that were factored into that uh, new version 
That's great. Well, thank you, Holden. Well, I know uh, tomorrow and the next day we'll have a chance to chat as well, maybe about some other science that's gone on in the background as well. Uh, while COVID has been front and center, uh, the rest of the world has not stopped, and there's some great science to talk about there. Yeah, uh, just one last thing. Yeah. Is there some kind of round, furry uh, preacher on <laughs> Olga's podium that <laughs> may have... Be an she, she, she's to, got this new pet uh, a yeah. television this, show this, this new... about <laughs> astronauts or something it, like some, that something like that yeah yeah there there is something over there okay that's but, just what i heard I, I appreciate you pointing that out <laughs> yeah all right all right we will talk to you tomorrow uh same all time right. same place thanks Olga. okay all right, uh, now I'm going to toss it over to Olga and the guide desk uh, where she can uh, show us her, her new pet and, uh, and tell us about what's coming up. Well, thank you very much, Sudip. Um, my Tribble and I will, um, will join you and the rest of the uh, meeting audience for our big plenary lecture for the day presented by Johnson & Johnson. We're so excited to be joined by sociologist Ruha Benjamin at 4 p.m. Eastern. After that, we have an after hours exchange event at 5 p.m. Eastern from Arizona State University from COVID to cancer, the biochemistry of vaccine design. Also at 5 p.m. Eastern, AAAS's dialogue on science, ethics, and religion will be hosting no wine, no cheese, no problem. Science and Faith Networking Social. This is BYO <laughs> charcuterie. <laughs> I did not write all the jokes, people. <laughs> there will be another exchange event at 6 p.m. Eastern from Arizona State University. How do you know you are a transient? Predicting collapse of ecosystems with machine learning. We also have a series of business events and social sponsored by the 24 disciplinary sections of AAAS. From astronomy to linguistics, biology to physics, neuroscience to social science, communications to science policy. Section business meetings are an opportunity for section leaders and members to converse about topics of interest to their section. These business meetings and socials are open to all registrants and are live only. Recordings will not be available for on-demand viewing. Today, we have events from the sections on industrial science and technology, engineering, geology and geography, information, computing and communication, mathematics, pharmaceutical sciences, physics, and chemistry. Check the online program for, exact, for the exact timing of these meetings and social events. Now, back to you, Suda. Thanks, Olga. In just a moment, we'll hear from Johnson & Johnson's Seema Kumar, who will introduce today's plenary lecture. Hello everyone, I'm pleased to be here with you virtually to champion science, to champion inclusion, and to help bring forward new ideas and new thinking that make our world a better place. As many of you know, at Johnson & Johnson, we've been working hard to address the COVID-19 pandemic by innovating new vaccines and also by innovating how we manufacture and make them accessible to people everywhere. To bring forward the best ideas the very best thinking and the very best innovation, it takes the know-how and ideas of diverse people from across the globe. And to bring those technologies to people everywhere at the scale COVID demands, it also takes deep cultural competency and powerful leadership and collaborations. In fact, the COVID-19 pandemic has opened the world's eyes to another pandemic that has plagued us for centuries, systemic racism. In the US, both Black and Latinx communities have experienced four times the number of hospitalizations and almost three times the number of deaths due to COVID. There are many ways we can all work together to help reduce the inequities that threaten health in communities of color. For example, we can ensure clinical and medical care is connected with the social and cultural needs by supporting better representation of people of color in medical science and health professions. We can continue to work to increase access and participation in clinical trials among diverse populations. And we can invest in scalable and sustainable health solutions that have the potential to create positive impact for communities of color. 
The good news is that companies like Johnson & Johnson, public officials, and private citizens are taking action. As the largest and most broadly based healthcare company in the world, we are uniquely positioned to convene private, public, and community organizations in pursuit of this shared aspiration. It's why we recently committed to $100 million to help advance racial and social justice. It's also why we support important thought leadership presentations like the one we're about to hear today. So it's important that we continue to share new ideas, new thinking, and that we continue to remain vigilant and engaged. So with that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Ruha Benjamin. Dr. Benjamin will share with us some very interesting new thinking about the ways technology and society interact and influence one another. She's an associate professor at the African American Studies at Princeton University, the founding director of the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab, and the author of the award-winning book, Race After Technology, Abolitionist Tools for the New Jim Code. She's also the editor of Captivating Technology, among many other publications. Her work investigates the social dimensions of science, medicine, and technology, with a focus on the relationship between innovation and inequity, health, and justice. She's the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including from the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Science Foundation, Institute for Advanced Study, and the President's Award for Distinguished Teaching at Princeton. Dr. Benjamin, I'm so honored to listen to your presentation today, and I'm looking forward to learning from you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am thrilled to be in conversation with you today at the AAAS. Um, my comments today are framed around this question.